Um, I don't feel bad if you only have one sentence written because everyone processes differently and some people take longer to do the thinking, the writing in the head first. And so please, I don't want anyone to feel discouraged by this exercise, just to be helpful. May I have two volunteers to share their paragraph? Ms. Charlene? Yes. Um, Christmas, I thought this was a, the lead was a, a newsy lead. Paragraph okay. number four on page nine. Okay. So I chose to, I chose that lead. Alrighty. And I started rewriting <laughs> from what I had underlined was everything that was centered around the fact that Helena was saved. Mm. Okay, so I said Helena, a student at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida was killed during the Valentine's Day Massacre. Surviving students had a memorial service for Helena who had a personal relationship with Jesus, knowing that she is now with him in heaven. Mm. And I didn't get a chance to, to finish. Yeah. <laughs> I like that, I like that. You're, you're centering it on Helena as your lead. Mm -hmm. and, you, and she pulled a lot of the details in there. Yeah, very nice. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, do you have a, would you like to share yours? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I said, Helena, um, Helena I'm a senior student of uh, um, FP, whatever that is, First Pre Presbyterian, uh, sorry, whatever. Marjorie <laughs> First, <laughs> Yeah, all that was one of the 17 killed at the, um, the name of the school and shooting on Valentine's Day in Parkland, South Florida. Then I said, reflecting on her life, Chris Lane said, "She quote, she is one, she is not with us now, but she is in heaven mm -hmm. with Jesus." Um, and then I wanted to write what the other students said. She was fun loving and all those things. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a chance to. Write <laughs> okay, so you focused on Helena as well. Yes, that's okay. one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Barb? Would you like to share yours? I. I I'm got sorry. a different part of the story. Yeah. I was totally touched by the you didn't even know them at mm -hmm. the uh, Go ahead. the outpouring of love. Yeah. Um, so um, the student, Christy, um, she said you didn't even know them, and there you were responding at mm -hmm. this funeral for Miss um, uh, Helena, mm -hmm. um, bringing comfort to us who, you know, you weren't even here, you didn't, but you were still bringing us comfort, and I thought that, that was touching. So mine started out as a quote, you don't even know them. Mm -hmm. I thought that was important to me. Mm -hmm. okay. You wanna read your whole leaf? Oh, uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go, ready? <laughs> you don't even know them, thought Christy Vador, a student at Marjorie Douglas High School, while contemplating the outpouring of love and comfort by all of the FP campus coaches as her, at her dear friend Helena Ramsey's memorial service. An uh, ongoing sentence, sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. Christy was in mourning for her friend Helena, who had been killed in the tragic shooting at Stoneman Douglas. Christy's overwhelming sense of mourning was comforted by those who took their time to be present during her time of grief. Now, there's a lot I could do to fix that. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. So that really stood out to you, mm -hmm. that they were ministering to the kids who were hurting. Mm -hmm. And that really, um, the heart of that story was the ministry to the kids that were hurting. And so there were, there is a lot in the lead. It's a different scenario. I didn't start with this moment, but I wanted to show you when you have two people talking about the same moment, you can kind of pull from both of them to sort of craft that moment. Um, uh, yeah, but the heart of the story was the comfort that was coming to those in trauma or grief through the believers, through the church, capital C. Um, anybody else want to share? Um, Lindsay, you've got a couple paragraphs written back there. I really <laughs> would rather not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm so bad about calling on people who didn't volunteer. So <laughs> <laughs> they can tell you to teach. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody have a different angle? No, I have a question. So I want to know the thought behind how you came up with that heart of the story, meaning like what were your, what drew you, like what did you highlight in the story? I could, I guess I could say I would try to imagine I was the person who was the um, interviewee, and if I felt that there was one part in this whole story that the interviewee thought was important, it was the fact that they didn't even know these people, and here they are taking their 
sacrificing their time, and they probably came from many different places as chaplains to come see these uh, these grieving people. Mm -hmm. And so, if I was a if I was her, that would be my um, I put myself into her place. Mm -hmm. That would be my my mm -hmm. key. My you know, oh, and yeah. And you could write it like this: Crystal Vidor, and her first name is Crystal. And that it's that's okay. actually how she spells it. So Crystal. always have to be careful with the funny spellings of people's names. And my name's Christmas, so maybe I'm sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> no. Crystal Vidor stood uh, by the little white cross in Parkview uh, Park. Um, tears were streaming down her face. All she could think of was her friend Helena, shy, funny, uh, who was a regular at First Priority Christian Club at Bloody Bloody Blah. Right. Um, she needed this time to mourn. It had been only a week since a shooter had, you know, killed 17 people, da da da, da at the high school. Um, as she looked around at the other people beside her, she was surprised to see so many Christian leaders reaching out, hugging the kids, listening to their stories, holding their hands. These people don't even know us, right? So there's a lot of ways you could pull the reader right into that moment. And what I did, and you, I didn't have a chance to get you the photograph, but I looked up, what did this look like? And it's a, a, a big, wide, green field, and every once in a while they had a cross, and then on the cross was piled like letters or photographs or little memorabilia of the people. Um, and so I do talk about this moment in the story, but it has to be like really short. It's not the lead, so I only get like a paragraph to talk about it. Um, but I try to bring the reader there mm -hmm. because it's an example of how Christ was using his body to minister to these students who were just raw with grief and shock. And Crystal was so cute when I was interviewing her. She's like, well, I wasn't really doing much ministry that day. I'm like, that's okay. You were grieving. Like, you know, so, um, but anyway, so now you, you see, okay, let's take it a step further <clears throat> and pull out your little Allison Crute handout. It's your two page. In the interest of time, because it's one o'clock, I'm just going to quickly run you through these notes. So the first paragraph is Allison, and I had to do a lot of this through text, which is not my, <laughs> this is not what I, wait, I like to interview people, but because of the situation, Allison was still in the hospital, she was not able to talk to me on the phone, we just had to work with what we had. So first she tells me why she was in Las Vegas, and this is for the Las Vegas shooting story. Don't look at it yet, but this is from the shooting. So she tells me why she was in Las Vegas. Um, um, she's telling me how she ended up at Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas, why she went there. I asked her what did she remember about his message that touched her heart, because she actually ended up giving her heart to Christ that morning. And this was, oh gosh, the Sunday following, so it wasn't even a whole week since the trauma, but she had just gotten out of the hospital. Um, and so I asked her what touched her heart that morning, uh, the pastor's message about God being our first responder. She talks about how that ministered to her because she was a nurse. And then the th you see the sentence that starts in the third line, how he literally put his life down for us, him being there when you need him most to save you, even when you don't deserve it sometimes. This is really the heart of what's touching her about Jesus. And the, it's highlighted, but you can hardly tell. It's like a very pale gray on your handout. Mm -hmm. But this is, I read the whole thing over, and this is what I felt was that moment when she was coming face to face with Jesus and really understanding, he's my first responder. Like, I'm in trouble, I'm dying, and he's the one reaching out to me with the life preserver. He's the one who's there offering that to me. Um, and so that became part of a quote later. Um, and then she talks about the life preserver, and I actually went back and listened to this whole message because I wanted to hear exactly what he said so that when I wrote the story, I could craft it really, and thankfully, the whole entire thing was online, <laughs> so, and then I even got to see her walk up, so, um, then I could get a feel for the room, how many people went up, if she was crying, the tone of his voice as he said these things about Jesus, what scriptures he was using. So it gets really exciting when there's an actual video of your story. <laughs> you can, um, and then uh, she even talks about laughing at part of the message. Um, 
I didn't want to make any more changes in my life, uh, that it was stressful. So, uh, and then she starts talking about how she just was able to sleep for the first time. It had been about a month since this happened. Um, and she tells me a little bit about her boyfriend and how he's doing. And then um, bottom of the page, uh, and then she does tell us that her boyfriend was sobbing, tears, you know, God's love was hitting him. Um, and then her boyfriend says, we can't ignore God anymore. Um, and then she tells me about how they almost died uh, a few months before this when a plane malfunctioned. Um, so th she's telling me this because she can see now God's been trying to get our attention for a few months. So it's important. It is relevant, even though it's a totally different event. Um, and then next page, I know this shooting made us both realize our mortality, right? And now she's face to face with, you know what? Even though we're young and we're living our best years of our life, we could die. So she's faced her mortality. Um, and then she tells me there's many times we should have died based on where, where we were standing the first two nights compared to the night of the shooting. Um, they changed their place in the crowd that third night. Um, everyone died where we had been standing. Mm -hmm. Uh, when she was dancing, she pulled her arms down over her chest, and she got shot uh, right over her heart and her left forearm. So she recognized, she's telling me, she recognized, that should have killed me. If I hadn't pulled my hand down, it would have went straight into my heart, end of, you know, end of the story. So she starts telling me all these things that happened in those moments. She should have died here, she should have died here, she should have died here. Um, it amazes me. It's taken a lot for me to see what he's done for me, but I see it clearly now. That would be a great quote, right? That's her own word. She's telling us this, right? Um, she's a nurse. She knew how bad it was. She had three tourniquets because she was bleeding so bad. So she's telling me I should have bled to death in the parking lot, you know? Um, and then I ask her, well, did Andrew save your life? That's her boyfriend. She says, yeah, he jumped on top of me. And then she starts telling me the play-by-play. -play. Mm -hmm. He jumps on top of me. The bullets are flying. Da, 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 da. And when your subject does that, you just let them go. You just let them get it out. And you don't stop them. You just let them remember. Because um, they'll start remembering things they don't even realize they still remember that. Um, so she starts telling me how about the bullets flew over. And um, he's yelling at people that she needs help. And she's laying there. And he's laying over her. And the bullets are still flying. And she gets hit. And... He gets hit in his arm, and um, the bullet was hot, right? It's a hot bullet, she says. That's good information. Several other times, he was making sure I got to a hospital. Then she tells this crazy story. He played tug-of-war with my body, and I'm not going to say this out loud, when someone tried to pull me out of the minivan that was taking us to the hospital. Blah, 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 blah. So she's just telling me amazing things, and there's a point to it because she can see now that she should have died, but God saved her life. Saved it here, saved it here, saved it here. So there's actually a point to all this. Um, uh, so that's some of the interview notes with her. If you go to issue 74, page 16, you see how we take this all jumbled memories and things that are going on and we turn it into the lead of the story. And you guys will probably see different ways you would have written the scene, and that's okay. Um, so we start, I decided to start with her sitting there in the church a week after this happened and realizing that she needs to give her life to Christ. Well, it could have started with the bullets flying, could have started with, but I felt like I was supposed to start here. Allison Crute, so we're in issue 74, page 16. Allison Crute sat listening to Pastor Derek Knighter's message at Calvary Chapel, Las Vegas. Where are we? Calvary Chapel. Chapel. Okay. okay. Yeah. Her arm in a sling marked Vegas strong. She's been wounded. It was hard to believe a week ago she and her boyfriend, Andrew Camp, had been wounded in the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history. Well, now you know why we're talking about her and why her arm is in a sling and how long it's been since that happened. But this morning she was ready to hear from... God, right? Though she grew up in a Christian home, see, I got to give you some of her backstory now, right? Though she grew up in a Christian home, religion wasn't always a top priority for her. Instead, she sought to enjoy life, surfing, hiking, becoming a travel nurse. Over the past week, she realized that God had spared her life many times, but the nightmare last Sunday was the one that finally woke her up. 
All right, so we have pulled you right in. We've told you what's happened to her, and we've told you where she's at spiritually right now. She's starting to realize, oh my goodness, I almost died again. I almost died. You know, there were several moments in the night I should have died. So Pastor Derek read 1 John 4.19, which says we love him because he first loved us. Derek explained that Jesus is the ultimate first responder. God saw us dying in our sins and threw us a life preserver, his son. Now, why am I talking about this part of the message? Because she was, right? That really stood out to her. That got Allison and Andrew's attention as she is a nurse and he had once been a paramedic. Mm. So Pastor Derek explained in a way that they could understand, right? And it, Pastor Derek explained, God has extended his son to us. All you have to do is take the hand of Jesus Christ and God will deliver you, rescue you, save you, give you a new life and restore what's been broken. How come I could quote that? Because I went back and listened to the message. He described how a drowning man doesn't hesitate to take the life preserver or ask for a different color or shape. Allison laughed, and she told me I laughed at that. I thought that was funny, but thought soberly, good point. And she's told me these thoughts, good point. God has sent me so many signs and messages, and I just didn't want to accept what he was offering me. But am I ready to make another major change in my life right now? Now you'll see that I've kind of boiled down and condensed some of the things she was telling me, but the good thing is I sent this to her to read before we published it. So you you can have a little bit of license to do that. She looked at her left arm. She had been dancing with her arms over her head. Now I'm going to take you to that night. I, I, and it's, it's a flashback. It's really effective in a lead. She looked at her left arm. She had been dancing with her arms over her chest. That's why the bullet heading toward her heart had instead hit and shattered the radius bone in her arm. That was the first miracle. Hmm. She remembered lying on the ground, bleeding badly. See, we don't want to just talk about the gore. We're trying to show that these are miracles happening because we're telling from a spiritual perspective, right? She remembered lying on the ground, bleeding badly. As a nurse, she knew her artery had been severed. Andrew threw himself over her body, shielding her, and taking shrapnel in his left arm and saving my life, she thought. Suddenly a man had lifted her, carrying her on his back to a safer spot at the House of Blue's tent before sprinting back toward the gunfire. Amidst continued gunfire and chaos, I'm trying to keep the reader in the moment, right? A U.S. Army corpsman had put three tourniquets on her arm and helped Andrew get her into a minivan to rush to a hospital. Someone tried to pull her out of the van, but the two of them pulled her unconscious body back inside. She saw God's hand in so many ways, even in them choosing a different spot in the crowd that, night, that third night of the festival. Everyone who had been where they were sitting the night before was now dead. She and Andrew had talked about that, realizing they were blessed by God to be alive. Maybe that was why Andrew had changed his mind at the last minute and hired a car to get to the church. So then the pastor goes on. He's telling them, urging them to give their lives to Jesus. And then um, uh, she, she says, don't wait to get shot to realize Jesus is there for you. That's a great quote. <laughs> um, and... Uh, so anyway, so it goes on to tell the things that stood out to her and how um, she accepted Christ. And then we went on to talk about God's presence in suffering because this article is also instructive to the Christian who can go out there and minister to someone who's been through trauma. And that we should. And we should tell them about the hope of Jesus. And then, and then we talked more about I thought that was so interesting. And then we talked about a gentle approach. If someone's been through trauma, you be gentle as you talk to them. Because that's what they're telling me, these people that the Lord was using to reach these people. And there's even a picture of her up there with her family on the day she accepted Christ. And so, yeah. So that's how we pull this, all this messy stuff from the interview into the lead. And flashbacks are a great way if you kind of have a two-headed lead. You want to talk about her getting saved that day, but then you also have to talk about the shooting. Because as she's sitting there remembering, God saved my life, then he saved my life, then he saved my life, then, that's what's leading her to come to Christ that morning. God's using all of it, you know? And so flashbacks are really nice in your leads. Okay, any questions or comments about that? What kind of lead did you call it? Narrative. 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 Yeah. Is that you were going to say, Cortez? Narrative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that was going to be my question. Okay. All right, now we're going to change gears, and we're going to talk about interviewing. So go to page 15. And 
and I'm just going to tell you the interview process is one of the hardest parts of our job. <laughs> Don't be discouraged, but we're going to give you some tools. All right. Why is the interview process so hard? Because we're dealing in spiritual realities, but we have to speak in external evidence. Okay, what in the world did she just say? All right. We're not looking for a simple anecdote or sterile fact. We are digging for the heart of who? God. I'm on the top of page 15. For the spiritual story, for his heart, for what matters to him, we are dealing with complex internal spiritual realities. God's love, his power to change, overcoming spiritual warfare. These are complex things. This is not a simple thing you could explain, right? This is what we're talking about, but we must prove and show these realities through external evidence, right? Action, fact, testimonies. We're showing the spiritual through the earthly. This is not easy. It is the most challenging kind of journalism and the most rewarding. Because showing the spiritual reality is our goal, the interview process is more rigorous, and we must include the Lord himself in the process. During the interview, stay tuned into the Holy Spirit. At the beginning of the interview, pray and welcome the Lord into the conversation. I can't tell you how important that is. I've been a secular journalist. I worked for a newspaper in Alabama. We did not pray with our subject. We weren't talking about spiritual realities. This is harder. If I just wanted to ask you, oh, tell me about that event you guys had at your work and how many people came and what you thought about it. Okay, I got my story. Mm-mm. For this, we have to go so much deeper with people. And sometimes we're talking to people about stuff they haven't even really talked about with anybody else. You know, I'm asking this girl, how did you see God's hand during the shooting? She hadn't really talked about that to anyone except her boyfriend, and he, he, he was in trauma. So it was almost a, a ministry moment to help her see the hand of the Lord, right? Um, and I love this uh, Proverbs 3, 6. It's very true for us in this kind of writing. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Who wants these stories to be told? Jesus. Jesus. God. So he's on your side. He's on your team. He's in you. He's working through you. Acknowledge him. Invite him into it. Depend on him. I think I told, confessed to you guys last time that it's easy for me to think, oh, I've been doing this for 20 years. I know how to do it. And the Lord often says, Christmas, don't get cocky. <laughs> you know, you've got to pray. You've got to rely on me here, not your experience, right? Um, and you're trying to discover the spiritual heart of the story. That's not always obvious. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes your subject understands God's heart, and that can be a great question. What do you feel is God's heart for the people of Cuba? And if there's someone who's been there several times and they, you can tell how they're speaking about these people, that they care about them, they'll give you a great answer. Um, that some people will, they'll give you spiritual insight. God's love, God loves these Cuban people. Or God has compassion, he knows how afraid they are. Or he really wants them to be saved. He wants to calm their fears. But some people will not understand that question. What is God's heart? I don't know. You know? Mm -hmm. Do you go to your interviewees? In interviews and interviewees knowing who they are, or is it a surprise to you that they know Christ? Sometimes. Oh, I always know who I'm interviewing. And how do you know that? How do we find them? How do you find them? Um, well, that's a whole that's a whole journey in itself. Um, but let's talk about that. If I don't talk, if I don't answer your question by the bottom of the page, then stop. All right. Okay. Um. So some people will not understand that question, God's heart, or they don't know. It's okay. They just don't know. As you interview people, listening and digging and looking for God's heart, it may become clear right away, or you will need to interview several people. It just depends on the story. The key is to keep looking until you know that you have found it. And I would underline that, until you know that you have found it. And a lot of writers, you know, you, you think, well, I only have time to interview two people. And so I'm going to interview two people, and then I'll write my story. Well, hopefully you've gotten the heart of the story, but if you haven't, you've got to keep going. And that is hard work. Um, once you find it, and you know you found it, God's compassion for Cambodian orphans, let's say, 
then you must dig out enough evidence of how this is being shown by believers or getting through to non-believers. That is in the details. The details, details, details we've been talking about. We must ask enough of the right questions as he guides. So Barb's question is actually a really good question. So what will happen is uh, we'll say, um, uh, hey, Jamal, uh, this church went to Cuba. Here's the leader and a couple people on the team. Go for it. And then Jamal will call the leader and say, hey, so you led this trip to Cuba. Tell me about it. And he'll have his list of questions. He'll interview that person. Now, maybe the leader is able to articulate God's heart for the Cuban people. Or maybe the leader's head is in the logistics. Well, first we went here. We went to, we went to 10 villages. And we, did, we, we handed out 300 pairs of glasses. And we did this, and we did this, and we did this. And that's all good information because it's evidence and it's details. But we don't have the heart of the story yet. Well, was there anyone who talked to anyone there and you could really, like maybe they accepted Christ or they had a changed perspective about the Lord? Oh, I don't know. I, I wasn't really the one talking to people, right? Oh, well, who were some of the people that were talking to the people? <laughs> oh, well, you could call Joe so-and-so. Okay, can you give me his number, right? right? And sometimes uh, you are going to have to call a bunch of people to find that. And sometimes we'll give you the, the name and the number. We'll say, oh, this was the assistant pastor. you got to call him because he was in charge of it and da-da-da. Or this is, but sometimes you'll interview someone and you'll say, well, was there someone who led someone to Christ or someone who told you stories about a changed life? Uh, yeah, that was, that was Miss So-and-so. Can I have her number? And then you have to go, hi, Miss So-and-so, I work for Calvary Chapel Magazine. I'm writing a story about your recent trip to Cuba. I'd like to ask you some questions about what you felt like the Lord was doing there, right? And that is the digging and the persevering and the chasing down that heart of the story. And sometimes you get it in the first interview, great. And sometimes you have to interview five people <laughs> before you get anywhere, right? Um, okay, so that leads us to our next point, talking to the right person. We often start with the pastor or leader of a ministry. Many times this person is in tune with God's heart and is on the ground ministering to the people so he or she can tell you about changed lives. Remember, this is the goal, evidence of God changing lives. But sometimes the pastor is busy overseeing a staff of under-shepherds, and it's one of the under-shepherds who actually ministers to the youth or homeless or hurting families or drug addicts, the person changed by God. So not only do you need to dig during an interview, but you need to hunt down the right person to interview. An interview process can look like this. And I just decided to make a chart because it's a little <laughs> bit confusing. So let's say you start with the senior pastor. And you can put a number one there. Or you can just remember in your head. We start with the senior pastor. Hello, senior pastor. You know, tell me about what are some exciting things God's been doing. Oh, we have this great homeless ministry. It's been really wonderful. Oh, can you tell me about any of the homeless people that have been touched? Well, I don't really go. Okay, well, who does go? Well, our assistant pastor heads that up, and he goes down there sometimes. Oh, he does? Great. Okay, can I have his name and number? All right. Or, well, we also have this wonderful thing where we, we reach out to traumatized women. Oh, really? Can you tell me about any of them? No, but my wife could. Okay, give me your wife's name and number. So then we interview the assistant pastor, and the assistant pastor, he does know. Uh, someone whose life was changed, and he says, oh yeah, let me tell you, this guy named Joe, he's been coming for five years, and blah, 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 right? And you might get to interview Joe, or you might just have to take the story from the assistant pastor. And then you think, well, that's pretty good. I got the story of Joe and his changed life, but I still need to call the, the senior pastor's wife. So I call her, and she says, yes, we have a wonderful ministry. We work with traumatized women, and God's really been doing a lot. You say, great, can you tell me about somebody whose life has changed? I don't really go to the to the house calls, I just kind of teach the Bible study. Well, is there anyone at your church who does go? And who, oh yeah, there's this one lady, Nancy. Can you give me her name and number? So then you call Nancy and you say, Nancy, can you tell me about a woman whose life was changed in this ministry? Oh yes. And then she tells you. So you've had to interview four, three people just to find the changed life. And then you have the changed life of Joe and the changed life of the lady. Now you have to ask yourself what? Which one do I write? Which one's the lead? <laughs> Which one's the heart of the story, right? Um, I don't know if it's in this issue. We did a story on a church, Calvary Chapel, Delaware County, and that church had so many amazing ministries going on. I think I interviewed, it's in issue 74, page 20. I think I interviewed um, 15 people for that story. <laughs> it was a lot of interviews. But they were doing so much. 
And um, if you look at page 21 of issue 74, there were so many ways I could have started this story because they had so many ministries. They had homeless ministry. They had literacy ministry. They had feeding ministries. They had, they went and worked in the Bronx every summer. They did so many things. And so as I did all those interviews and I kept digging and I kept going and trying to find out as much as I could about these different ministries, I finally interviewed this lady who said, well, yeah. Um, and one of the kids that we met in the Bronx came and lived with my family for four years. What? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we got to know him through going there every year, and, and he believed in Jesus, but he had a really hard time because he was from a really rough neighborhood, and da 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 didn't have any support at home, and da 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 and wanted to make a change in his life. Can you tell me about him? Oh, yeah. Do you have his phone number? Yeah. So then I get to call this kid, and his name's Valentin. He loved being interviewed. He was so great. And I, I'm talking to Valentin. I said, Valentin, what was, like, one of those moments with that family? What was a moment with that family that you will never forget? I said, I'll never forget my first Christmas. I said, wait, your first Christmas? He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, how old were you, 20? He'd never had a Christmas. No one had ever bought him a present. He had never been in a family like that laughing and having fun. And I'm like, tell me about that, you know? And so he's telling me. And he's like, well, I got the daughter something, and I was watching her, and then they got me, and then she got me clothes, and she got my size and my style. Never had anyone care that much to even know what size of a shirt I wear. And so I started there, because I felt like, and amazingly, we got a photograph from that right. day, and it's right there. Right. Um, right. But there were a lot of ways I could have started this story, but that was the one that really like stood out to me. Because it's one thing to say, oh, let's go reach out to this people group. But it's another thing to bring him into your home and have Christmas with him and love on him and buy him a shirt and his style and his size. And, it, and that was showing the heart of Jesus. That was showing that individual love and care and that they weren't just reaching out and then going home, bye, I hope you have a nice life. But they were really pulling people in and loving on them. And that's what I kept encountering with this church, that they were really connecting with the people they were ministering to. Um, okay, but that was a lot of interviewing. And it would have been really easy to feel like, I'm never going to get this story done because I'm interviewing 20 people. <laughs> um, but you have to. You have to keep going until you hit the heart, until you strike gold. Um, now, sometimes you have a really short story, 800 words. And there's no point to be interviewing 20 people for an 800-word story. Right. And you might just, have to, might just have to be a newsy story. And you might just have to write about it from a less personal angle. And if you only have one page, you really can't go that deep anyway. So every story is different. Um, but just know this, that this is what the interview process could look like. And you might have to interview four people before you actually get a changed life testimony. Um, okay. So let's go to page 16. I'd like to start us off, well, this is general interview guidelines. Okay. General interview guidelines. Um, this is for any kind of story. This is just stuff you should know when you're interviewing. Um, and what I didn't write down, I started thinking about, I wrote all these bulleted points, but here's some things that you really need to know just about interviewing in general. Your job is to ask questions and then listen. And a lot of times when you and I have a conversation with someone in real life, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Where are you from? Oh, here's where I'm from. Tell me a little bit about you. I'll tell you a little bit about me. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. An interview is different. An interview is, we both know I'm calling you because you have something that I need to hear. I'm representing the magazine. It's a professional call, even though it's ministry. Here's my name. Here's the story that we want to write. May I please listen to you now? And you don't interrupt them. And you don't, don't feel obligated to tell them all about yourself and try to make them feel at ease. You can do small sort of like, oh, how are you? You know, how's your day? How's your week going? You can do things to show that you're a human being and you care about them. Not just, uh, yes, I'd like to ask you a few questions. <laughs> you know, it's nice that they can feel that you're a friendly person and, and that you're a believer. Um, but you're not doing most of the talking on these calls. So just realize that if you're, if you're shy, that's good news to you. <laughs> if you're chatty like me and you try to make people feel at ease by talking to them, you have to sort of rein it in, right? And you're just a little bit of chit-chat. And are they comfortable? Okay, let's go, right? So 
You're listening more than you're talking. And another thing that's hard with an interview that's not like normal conversation for some of us is that you have to have moments of silence. Because if I'm going to ask you a deeply personal spiritual question, how did the Lord set you free from fear? That person might need a second, mm. right? They might even start to cry. And me, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Nope, you gotta, you got to swallow that down. Because a lot of times when they start to cry, it's good. <laughs> because they're remembering. Right. They're remembering what the Lord did. And they're about to tell you from the depths of their soul. And it's probably to do with the heart of the story. Mm-hmm. Right? And um, we did a story on human trafficking. And I talked to a girl about how in the world did you end up being an exotic dancer and a prostitute. And she started remembering her abusive childhood. And she cried. And I cried, but you can't let them hear you cry. You have to put it on mute, right? But, and, and I just had to sit there for a second and let her cry. And let her catch her breath. Let her think about how did she want to start? And what did she want to say? What did she not want to say? And then she was ready, and then she talked, right? You have to do that. It's not like normal conversation. And a lot of times we don't want to make someone cry. We don't want them to be upset. You're not trying to make them cry. That's not your goal. You're just trying to get to the heart of what the Lord's been doing. But a lot of times we're talking to people about stuff that's so personal or so deep that they need a minute. Now, sometimes you interview a pastor, they talk every day. <laughs> they have people asking them questions every day. They're going, and you have the opposite problem. Because that starts to give you a sermon. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, And we'll talk about that in a second. But for most people, they've not been interviewed. They've not been interviewed on the phone with someone they can't even see their eyes and having to remember deeply personal things or even think about, well, how did the Lord set me free from fear? That's a good question. I I guess it was, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. And then you have to kind of draw it out and listen and go, "Mm -hmm, and then what? You know, and so it's a totally different kind of a conversation to interview someone. And if you're uncomfortable with pain, if you're uncomfortable with tears, if you're uncomfortable with, you just have to sort of give that to the Lord because it's your job to listen. It's your job to dig for those things. Um, Okay, so that's just my pep talk about interviewing. So here's some, some guidelines. Before the call, do as much research as you can. That's your responsibility. That's any good journalist will do that. I didn't call Allison and say, where are you from? I went on Facebook, and I found that she was from Virginia. And I found out which arm did she get shot in. And I found out how, when did she get released from I found out as much as possible, because it's going to be hard enough for her to talk to me without me asking her a bunch of silly questions, right? So you find out as much as you can beforehand. That's your job. And then you'll have better questions. You'll come up with better questions before you even get on the phone, right? Don't you want to know as much about a situation before you go into it as possible? Absolutely. Yes. So that's your job, research. Then what I like to do, just as a courtesy thing, is inform the senior pastor and ministry leader that we will send them a copy of the story before it runs so they can check it for errors. Why would I say that at the beginning instead of at the end of my interview? For For trust. For trust. I'm not Channel 7. Right. I'm not the New York Times. I'm with you. We're on the same team. You're going to see this before it runs, so we're not going to shock you or twist your words or whatever. And sometimes you're going to interview someone who's had that happen. And they, oh, well, I've dealt with the media before. It's like, well, we're Calvary Chapel, and we just want to talk about what Jesus has done. You know? Um, and it just lets them know we're, we're partnering in this. Right. We're not here to like squeeze something shocking out of you and splash it on a front page. Uh, Ask them for their best email address while you're thinking of it. Um, Okay, ask them how much time they have. This is a good question. I started asking this at the beginning. How much time do you have to talk to me today? I've got about five minutes and I have to pick my kids up. Okay. What they don't know is we're going to talk about stuff. You might cry. Like, we can't have this conversation in five minutes. We can't have it while you're fixing your water heater. I had someone that did that while we were interviewing. It was a really hard interview because they were, like, trying to do their... And I'm like, Hello? And how did Jesus do that? Okay, all right, nothing to say. Um, Mm -hmm. So if they're in a place where they, and and, you know, I'm in the store. Well, are you in a store where you can speak about your traumatic childhood? I mean, maybe we should reschedule. What would be a better time for you? 
I mean, it's you have to, you know. Um, and a lot of times, if I'm emailing someone to set up a time, I'll say it'll take about thirty minutes, just so they know I'm going to need some time here, not five minutes, right? Interviewing people while they drive is hard. Some people are really good at it. Some people are terrible at it. So I don't know. Ask the Lord. <laughs> Because some people are so busy, like, especially if it's a senior pastor of a big ministry, he might be so busy that that's it, and he's going out of the country the next day. So you can get him on the way to the airport, and that's it. But thankfully, he's a senior pastor, so he's used to talking to people, so maybe it'll be all right. I don't know. But ideally, you want them to be focused. Always, always, always pray with them before asking questions. And, and it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. It shouldn't be a complicated or long prayer. Ask God to guide the conversation. Bring out what he wants in the story for his glory. That's it. And then it helps them realize, this isn't about me. I don't have to be shy and humble and embarrassed. This is for God. And this person is a Christian, and I'm talking to a brother or sister in Christ. Okay. I can speak about those deep things of the heart, and they're going to know where I'm coming from. Right? So it establishes, brings the Lord into it, reminds us who our eyes are on, and what we're doing this for. So it's really important to pray. Ask easy questions first. Now, not the ones you should have already found in your research, but just easy questions. How long have you been going to this church? How did the Lord bring you there? Because you're going to build up to, as you talk to them more, a confidence, a trust, and then you can ask the hard questions. So how, how did you end up becoming a prostitute? What led to that? You can't ask that first. <laughs> You've got to... Show them who you are, that you're listening, talk about some easy questions. Sometimes, if it's something where people need to remember an event that happened, if you just get them talking about the basics, the wheels start turning. But if you ask them just cold, so tell me about the most important moment during this mission trip. Oh, I don't know. Right, but if you say, well, where did you go? Oh, we went to this village, what did you do? We did BBS for these kids. How did they like, oh, they loved it, they were laughing, they were jumping up in, and they're remembering. The memories are starting to come, and then you can go deeper. Were there any kids that accepted Christ? Were there any kids that you could tell that they totally had a different demeanor when you left? Um, so it's a process. Go easy first and get deeper with them. And really at the end, you want to have the more difficult questions, the deeper questions. And we're going to talk later, next time, about tragedy, disaster, or very personal stories. All right. Don't take yes, no answers. Don't take yes, no answers. When you need more details, ask them, when, how, why? Can you tell me about that? Right? Say, oh, well, I, I, uh, my whole life changed when I was 15. What happened? Um, I, I started going to Calvary Chapel Fredericksburg. And then what happened? Well, I mean, I started learning more about God. Well, well what was the big change in your life? What, what, was, what was your life like before that, and then what did it become like after? I mean, you literally have to do this with some people. You, they'll give you one word answer, and sometimes they're shy. Sometimes they're nervous, and they're trying to just answer you quickly because they don't want to waste your time. I mean, you just never know why people might. And then some people, oh, well, you know, I've been in Fredericksburg for 20 years. It is the best town. Have you ever been that town? Have you ever gone to the ice cream shop, and that guy brings his own ice cream? Okay, and then you have those people. Right? And you have to gently lead them back to the point, you know. Cabbage Chef in Fredericksburg. How did the work? Um, so don't take yes, no answers, but also try to keep them on track. Um, try to interview a senior pastor first. Ask him for suggestions of others to interview. You're looking for people from two camps. Other people in leadership who are touching those changed lives. And they'll change lives. The people with the powerful, unique testimonies of how God has worked in and through them. It's best to have three to five people quoted in a story. That's really not a hard number. It depends how long your story is, what kind of a story it is, how many words you have. Um, use background sources. Um, encourage the interviewer to talk, interviewee to talk freely about what God is doing. You know, and I usually say, well, I have my list of questions, but please feel free to speak as the Holy Spirit leads you. Which also reminds them, not just talking about whatever you want to say, but as the Lord's leading you, right? Um, then you have to keep them on track and spiritually focused. And then, as I just said, some people are nervous or they're tangent takers. Listen long enough to see if they're going somewhere with the story, if they have a point, and then once they've made it, go, oh, well, that's great. So how did the Lord do that, right? So it's a gentle balance. It's a gentle balance of them being free enough to talk to you, you guiding
fighting it enough to keep them on track. And it just comes with practice. And every person you interview is different. Everyone's an individual. So it's almost like a learning process every time you talk to somebody. Um, and you can gently guide them back. Wow, that's wonderful. Can you recall any moments where you saw the Lord working? You know, so glad you had a wonderful time in Cuba with your family. Can you remember any time where you saw the Lord working? You might have to ask that question three times. And, you know, maybe rephrase it a different way or whatever. But there's people that you, you are just going to have to keep asking that question. And then finally they'll either say, well, no, I don't really remember anything. And then you realize, oh, that's why they're telling me. They don't really have an answer. Well, thanks so much for your time. Is there anybody else that you saw really interacting with the Cuban people and, you know, could have a testimony story or whatever? Oh, well, there was this one guy. Okay, thank you very much, right? Because either they have something to say, you got to get to it, or they really don't have anything to say. Usually people have something to say. You just have to ask them the right questions. Um, don't be afraid to repeat or rephrase those important questions as many times as you need to. It's your job. Don't be shy. I remember somebody telling me they, they felt bad to repeat a question. I'm like, that's your job. Because sometimes people, they're meaning to answer it, and they distract themselves while they're answering. Oh, oh, yeah, right, right. So, yeah, there was this guy who accepted Christ, you know? And you're just gently getting them back on track. Um, try to avoid Christianese. And people do talk that way. They, they can't help it. We were so blessed. We never used that quote. And we hear it every time we interview someone. I was so blessed. It was such a blessing. It was so wonderful. That's great, but that's not a quote. What was, what, how did you feel blessed? What did God do? Oh, I just, I mean, just, we just saw so many people just like, it was amazing. What was amazing? What really amazed you? Well, just, I mean, how God used us. Well, how did he use you? Well, like, where did you go? Oh, well, we went to a prison. Oh, okay, now we're getting somewhere. We went to a prison, and then what happened? All these people got saved. Really? All these, you know, and so you may have to do it that way, but you're trying to get them to be specific, right? Showing you, not just telling you. Um, when you think you found it, when you think you have found the lead, the spiritual heart of the story, try to get them. And sometimes you just have to let people go and tell you the whole thing, and then you go back. Tell me about that day at the memorial for Helena. Why was that a special day for you? I just, I guess I needed it. Why? What did you need? Well, I guess I needed to cry but I needed to be with people that I felt safe to do that with, you know? And so, so then were there a lot of people there? Was it all, all people who knew her? No, it really wasn't everybody who knew her. It was a lot of the leaders. And you're just drawing out, drawing out the specific details, and you're trying to get that. And if they, and a lot of times that's where the people get choked up, and they're remembering what they were feeling, because you might ask, how were you feeling at the memorial? Well, and this girl I interviewed started to cry and it's okay she's allowed to cry and I just waited and then she talked about why it was so important to her you know it wasn't the reasons I thought I thought she would talk about how she wanted to remember her friend and try to think of something good but she ended up talking about the leaders and how their love for the kids was what really stood out to her and what right. still she remembers I said okay that's what she has to say it's not always going to be what we expect sometimes it's nice it was something unexpected you know um At the end of each interview, always ask this question. I have learned this. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you feel is really important? Or are there any scriptures that really mean a lot to you about this? A lot of times that's where I get my best thing. You know why I think that is? This is my theory. It's because they have been processing the whole time that you've been interviewing and pulling all this stuff out of them. It's been processing, processing, processing. And maybe they said what they meant to say, and maybe they got off on a tangent, but we said, is there anything else that you feel is really important? Yes, this is what I think. And the last time I did that for this girl, Crystal, she went off on a 15-minute passionate sermon to other kids her age about having a faith for yourself and trusting God and reading your Bible and praying every day. And I'm like, I think this is, I think this is amazing. And we ended up using her, her, that whole part of the interview by itself because it was just, she just started preaching. And, and so always ask that. Always ask that because I, a lot of times you will strike gold right there. Um, okay, so that's general interview guidelines. We're almost done. We're almost to the end of our time together. 
So just to start you off, you're going to see, if you go home and read ahead, you're going to see that I break you down all different kinds of story types and what kind of interview questions are good for those. But here's the first one that is m the most likely you'll be assigned. The first would be a personal testimony story. And it's nice because you only interview one person. <laughs> and you kind of know I'm going to tell how God's changed their life. And we were pretty clear on that. But the overview is to share how God changed the life of one person. Usually we do non-pastors because we have pastors in every other story. So let's have a non-pastor. Um, sometimes we'll have a, a lady or a, a younger person, older person. It doesn't have to be any kind of person. Just um, someone with a dynamic or interesting testimony. And we're not looking for the most shocking, horrible things that person did, right? Our point is to bring glory to the Lord. So if the shocking, horrible things are part of that change, okay, you can tell me about that. That's not, we're not just digging for dirt. We're digging for the changed life and the, um, what God did, right? So Jesus is always central. You don't have to be limited to just how they got saved. That might be the story. That might be the testimony that you end up telling. But it could be what he's done since then. Or it could be something that he did years after they became a Christian. Like, we had a really powerful story, and um, you'll see it later, on three pastors who had cancer and how the Lord helped them through that and their struggles of faith and their questions to God and how they came through that. And that's years after they got saved. They were already in ministry. So their testimony was more, how did the Lord help them through that time? So you're not really limited to a specific thing unless we say, uh, call this person and talk to them about their illness. You know, that's what we want. Um, sometimes you're just looking for what is um, a dynamic thing that the Lord's done in their life. Okay. To make it valuable, and this is stuff, it's not a happy accident. The writer has to do this, right? To make it valuable, consider what has this person learned firsthand about Jesus or being a Christian or whatever that could benefit someone else? What challenges have they faced and overcome with Christ? How did Jesus meet them where they were and change them? You're, these are the kinds of things you want to know. So you're not just going blindly into this. Just tell me whatever you want to tell me. But these are the kinds of things you're looking for. Because then that's going to be valuable to who? The reader. The reader. So always we're thinking about the reader. How it can bless or minister to or instruct the reader. So essentials for personal testimony. You've got to take us there. Whatever that moment was, whether it's them getting saved or them, you know, dealing with cancer or them being called to the mission field, you've got to take us there. You've got to stop and say, well, where were you? And what was going on? What was in your mind? What were you seeing around you? What were you feeling? What, were, what did you feel God was saying to you? You know, what was happening? And you might have to ask them like 10 questions about that moment. But if that's your lead, it's okay. You know, and you can even say stuff like, tell me more. You know, if you can't think of a specific question, just say, tell me more. And then what? You know? Um, and sometimes people, it's so funny, sometimes people think they have nothing to say. And so you have to keep drawing it out. And then they say these amazing things. And sometimes people say, I don't really have anything to say. I don't know why you're interviewing me. Mm -hmm. Well, just tell me what the Lord did. And then they have these amazing things to say, you know? Um, real life anecdotes of significant encounters with God, salvation or rededication to Christ, a time when the Lord worked in their lives, how God changed their wrong thinking or helped them, etc. Specific verses. We always have scripture in every story. It's nice if it can be a scripture that was important to that person and they can tell you why. Their backstory. Like with Allison, I told you she grew up in a Christian home, but Christ really hadn't been a priority for her. So it's not like she never heard the gospel. She just really wasn't on following the Lord at that season of her life tells you a lot about why it was so powerful what God was speaking to her. Um, their challenges and their victories, the good, the bad, the ugly. If we only tell the good, it may seem phony, or you could miss something that the reader needs to hear, right? And Christianity is not always just happy, nice, fluffy, pretty things. I mean, when we did that story on the pastors with cancer, it was really neat. The writer had dealt with a lot of her own uh, illnesses and stuff and so she asked them did you have a crisis of faith and they told her which I thought was really amazing in them and honest of them and they said yeah actually there was one day I said God I have been a faithful servant of you why are you letting me die this horrible way what about my wife you know and and I, that is so powerful because then somebody's reading that going oh 
it's okay to suffer as a Christian, and it's okay to ask God these questions, and it's okay to be real with the Lord, and oh, he answered them, right? That's like the book of Job. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's in the Bible. So we need to put it in our stories, if it's relevant, if it's part of the, the heart of God. Um, and it helps someone see, if God can help them with that, if God can help a pastor who's having a crisis of, of faith, maybe God can help me with my crisis of faith, right? Um, and we always want to tell how. How did God help you with your addiction or your depression or your delusion? What scriptures, what truths, what things really ministered to you? What helped you? Um, and then here's a list of sample questions. And what I'd like you to do is go and look at some archive examples. Um, and I've, I've pulled a few out that I thought were really great. You can just go to archive and type in personal testimony and you'll see a lot. I'd really love it if you could look up this lady, Patty Height. She was in the homosexual lifestyle. The Lord reached into her life and, and changed her. And she tells so many things that are instructive and helpful. Why she was confused about her gender. How the Lord brought her to the truth. How she started walking with the Lord after she came to the truth. How the Lord called her to ministry. To start visiting churches and try to tell them how to reach out to people who are in that lifestyle. So it's a really powerful, really powerful testimony. I think it's one of the best testimonies we've ever had in the magazine. Just because it was so uh, helpful and vivid and amazing and a miracle. Um, And then there's some other ones here that I, I included. So your homework <laughs> for the next, you have three weeks, right? Mm-hmm. To complete the exercises, um, if they're unfinished, to read three personal testimony stories from the magazine. If you want to read them in the archives or in a hard copy, it doesn't matter to me. What does this testimony prove or teach about God? Why is it effective? How could it have been different or better? Those are just for you to consider. Then I want you to choose someone, and you can pray about this, choose someone to write a personal testimony story about. Has to be someone alive. Has to be someone you could actually call. Can't be like Tim Tebow, unless you know him. (laughs) Um, Come up with, look at the list of sample questions, see if these will fit with the person you're talking to. Come up with five additional questions, because you're gonna know a little bit about this person. Come up with five additional questions, and then interview this person. Here's your steps. Interview this person. Well, first you have to come up with questions. Transcribe or print out your notes. I brought something to show you. Highlight the important parts. Consider what is a life lesson, message, or theme to focus on. Then write a first draft. With like seven to 900 words, use at least two scriptures. Now you might write 1,400 words, and then you're going to have to trim that up back, right? That's okay. That's part of the process. It's good. Um, I wanted to show you, as far as just uh, technical stuff and things to help you, when you're interviewing someone, it's really nice if you can focus totally on them. And so what I like to do is use a recorder. I did not used to do this. I used to just type everything that they said, but I've gotten slower in my typing, and I would miss stuff here and there. So I have this. It's a little recorder. This is an Olympus. Uh, digital voice recorder WS853 uh, but any any little digital voice recorder and what you'll have to do is put your phone on speaker and put this right next to your phone so that it can pick up the sound you might be so techy that you can figure out how to hook up a microphone from your phone to the recorder and that's great because then you'll get even better quality recording record it and I usually say hey let me get my recorder turned on you know because that's ethically you're supposed to let people know if you're recording them but usually most people who talk to us know that they're on the record with everything they're saying. Um, and then what I do once I start recording, because the interview might be 20 minutes, might be an hour, might be an hour and 20 minutes. It depends on if the Lord gives them a lot of things to share with you. So I always have at least an hour and a half free for an interview personally. Um, and then to save your sanity, put the recorder on. You know, uh, if you want to record the prayer or not, that's up to you. But start the recording. Pay attention to the timestamp that's going on. And as they're talking, when they say something important, right, you know, the timestamp, one minute, 30 seconds, mm-hmm. salvation. That will save you. That will save you so much trouble because I didn't do that. I went down to New Orleans and I interviewed 15 people from Hurricane Katrina and I came back with 20 hours of interview, and I had to listen to every bit of that to find my notes. I thought, Christmas, what is wrong with you? 
why didn't you leave yourself a breadcrumb trail? So now, I every time, I even when I use the recorder, I make little notes. One minute, 30 seconds, salvation story. You know, five minutes, uh, first day in Cuba. Uh, you know, just, just something to get back. Now, if you are really fast at typing, and that's how you process, because I think that's how I process, you can type it. You can type it while you're recording. Try to keep it so that they're not going to hear all the clickety-click of your keys, because that'll distract them. Um, but record it, you know. Um, and even though it might feel a little awkward if you're in person and to put the little recorder there right near the person, don't put it like right in front of their face because then they'll feel like they have to look at the recorder and talk into it. But it as close to their face as you can without being weird. And, um, and then eventually they'll get used to it and they'll stop thinking about it. And, they'll just, and you're making eye contact with them and you're getting them to talk to you and then they'll forget about it and they'll just relax a little. But you, you really do need to record it. And you can use your phone if you're in a, a situation. Um, I, I got a phone call back once. I was in a parking garage. So I grabbed my husband's phone and used the recorder on that. And I just interviewed the person in the car. And I wrote down my little notes. OK, you know, this time stamp, this is what happened. Um, but I would invest in some kind of recording device. And if you want to use a landline phone and just use your cell phone as your recorder, that's fine. Just test it first, make sure it works, and you can hear. Um, all right. So. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. This person doesn't have to be a Calvary Chapel Christian. For our purpose for this class, no. If we were going to use the story for the magazine, they would need to somehow be connected to Calvary Chapel. Mm -hmm. Can this person be a relative? Yes. And here's my, I, that's a good question. I always get asked that question. If it's your relative, just remember, you can't look at them like you already know everything about their lives. You have to have an inquisitive mind. And you have to say, Aunt Josephine, tell me how you came to Jesus. Oh, you know. Now, could you just retell me? Just tell me again, and I'll record it, and I'll have it. And, and uh, so that's the challenge with family members. They'll think you already know, or you'll think you already know, but you really need to get it from them. Yes, sir? Um, uh, I know you said don't use any pastors, but like, if this person has a title of pastor, but like, say you've known them for a long time, and that's not the way you know them you personally. Can, you can do, you can interview any any believer. That's fine. Let's give you a big green light. Because it's just for this assignment. It's just for okay. this. Thank yes, ma'am. In case they ask who will be reading it, or who will see it, will anybody, or? I will. Okay. Um, you might share it with one other person in the class. Um, but it is good for them to know that um, other people besides you will read it. Um, when you're calling for the magazine, we always say, I'm with Calvary Chapel Magazine, so they know right away this is going to be in publication. Mm -hmm. And they probably need some assurances um, of their... Um, so, so like you said, you always give them an opportunity to... You give the pastors, the leaders of the church, the opportunity to read the story. Mm -hmm. We would want to do the same thing for them, mm -hmm. give them an opportunity to enforce mm -hmm. the symbol. Yeah, especially for publication. Like for this assignment, since it's not going to be published, you may or may not tell them that. Um, sometimes people, they get a little freaked out when they see themselves in print. Oh no, no, take it all away. I'm, I'm, who am I that I should be mentioned? You know, and they get can get embarrassed. But, um, Usually, like, we tell them we're Calvary Chapel Magazine, and so they know, like, we're going to write about you, <laughs> you know? Um, so however you want to handle that, I'll leave that up to you. But I'll read it, and, and uh, another person in the class might read it. Any other questions? Yes? In reference to the homework that we turned in today, I'm assuming you're going to read that, and we will I'm going to read it, and I'm going to write on it, and tell you my feedback and thoughts, and hopefully that will be helpful to you. Are you going to use but a I'm not going to grade it. <laughs> you use a red pen. I won't use a red pen, no. I'll use any color but red. <laughs> any other questions? What I would encourage you to do, here's what I would encourage you to do, and I wanted to do this in class. We didn't have enough time. I could do a four-hour class. <laughs> Is to uh, see if you can get a friend or someone to let you interview them. Because it's really nice if you have some practice first. It's like any other thing. Um, and interviewing someone for a story is different than any other kind of interview. A job interview is different. Um, 
first date is different, whatever. So um, I would practice on a friend. And if you want to have someone from this class, that might be good. Um, uh, just to get a feel for it.